This story starts with a tragic death and ends in the lost city of Atlantis, but most of it happens right here. This is Harstead Slough behind me, or Harstead Lake if you're feeling generous. We're just outside of Donnelly, Minnesota, and in 1869, my great-great-grandparents, Eric and Karen Harstead, moved from Norway to their new home on this slough. I'm Mike Schultz, I'm the great-great-grandson of Eric and Karen Harstead, and I make documentaries. This is Jeannie Ennen. She's also descended from Eric and Karen Harstead. We're third cousins, and she lives on their farm here in Donnelly. I am the fifth generation of the Harstead family to live on this farm place, and this is, as far as we know, the original house. So Eric Harstead was my great-great-grandfather, and he settled here with his wife, Karen, and their three sons in 1869. They were some of the first pioneer settlers in Stevens County. They came from Norway, they came through Quebec and Racine, Wisconsin, and then they came up and they worked on the railroad as far as Benson, which is about 40 miles from here. And they bought a team of oxen and a wagon and a cow and headed north and settled here. I have the trunk that they brought here from Norway and I use it actually in my house every day. It's a TV stand. And to me, that trunk says a lot about who they were and what, what kind of people they were. There's nothing fancy except for the writing on it, but it was very serviceable. They did what they had to do to survive and to, to make a new life for them and their children. And so they started with very little and built quite a life for themselves. That was true until February. 1873. Well, it started off as a very nice day with water dripping from the eaves. From the account that I've been told, he walked to Morris, to the mill, to grind feed or uh, wheat, I assume, and a storm came up. And he got as far as the lake, and I don't know where on the lake he got, and they found him the next morning uh, leaning against his sack of flour or whatever it was. Because he was so cold, when they warmed him up, the cold went in and stopped his heart. So he died and his wife was left to raise four kids on this place. The oldest was 12 and the youngest was two. So that was quite a, she was quite a woman. I have her picture hanging in my living room. And whenever I think I'm having a bad day, I look at that picture and I think, you have nothing to complain about. She never saw an easy day in her life. And I have some of her in me. So to me, that gives me a real grounding and a real source of strength to know the kind of people I come from. I like the shirt that you have on. Yes, I got to advertise for Donnelly. I met up with some more of my cousins to ask them about Eric and Karen Harstead at Donnelly Hall, which was once used for roller skating. So Eric and Karen Harstead would be my great, great grandma and grandpa. Um, they were the first ones to actually settle in Wrensville Township. The only thing I know is there was no trees here at the time. This was all prairie. And when you got a snowstorm, you got a snowstorm. And uh, he went to town to get groceries and he got as far as the slough and he was tired. So he sat down by a rat mound, you know, out there. He got tired and laid down, went to sleep and he froze to death. So that's why it's Harstead Slough, I guess. <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> it's called Harstead Slough, that's the name of it. But the DNR actually considers it a lake. Do you feel a little insulted that it's called Harstead Slough when it's actually a lake? Well, yeah, because, you know, Slough isn't quite as, you know, professional name as a lake, but... They named the Slough after the Harsteads. Why didn't Donnelly get to be called Harstead, Minnesota? I don't know. I mean, I guess it's just words on a map and... <laughs> but... So to have the slough named Harstead Slough is really cool. And you asked earlier if I thought that Donnelly should have been named after them. I think they were too humble to have wanted a, a town named after them. I think it's more fitting 
to the kind of people that they were, that they would have rather have had the slough named after them. Um, I think it's, uh, it's kind of who they were. Maybe I'm taking this too personally on behalf of my pioneer ancestors, but how do we decide who gets a town named after them? And where did the name Donnelly come from? Do you know who was Donnelly named after? <laughs> oh boy, I don't know if I know that or not. Ignatius Donnelly, you know, like he started this town. That's what the rumor is, but I don't know that much about it, so. So I know Donnelly is named after Ignatius Donnelly, but I don't know anything about the story or why it was named after him. So who was he? And why was Donnelly named after him? It's a weird name. Who was Ignatius Donnelly? He was a very well-known person. He was um, a Republican. He was a Democrat. He was Lieutenant Governor of the state of Minnesota. He was um, a writer. A writer of, of fiction and uh, or pseudoscience. This is the, uh, you know, the kooky part. He was a kind of uh, uh, a prophet. You know, he has the book Ragnarok. The story about the comet that struck the, the Earth. Yeah, the nonfiction can be really apocalyptic. Donnelly was a town builder, a town founder, a kind of real estate developer, a gentleman farmer. He was a two-term congressman. He tried to become a United States senator. He also ran for president of the United States. Yeah, but I think he, he did a lot of stuff. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think he's arguably the most famous Minnesotan uh, worldwide in the 19th century. This is Ignatius Donnelly or rather, an actor I've hired to play Ignatius Donnelly. Here's the real Ignatius Donnelly. And here's Jeff Kolnick. He's a history professor. I interviewed him at the Dakota County Historical Society because they have a giant map of their county on the floor. When I decided to study populism, at that point I kind of became a freak for Ignatius Donnelly. Donnelly was born the son of an Irish immigrant in Philadelphia in 1831. He moved to Minnesota in 1857. It's hard to think of Minnesota as the West, but when Donnelly moved to Minnesota, it was very much the West. And the first thing he did in Minnesota was to build a whole town. No, not this town. His first town was Nininger. So Donnelly, he bought up land there with a partner and uh, they tried to sell it. But Nininger uh, failed, you know, so it's kind of nothing but the road to it and a historical marker. and less than a ghost town. Yeah. Uh, my name is Patrick Coleman. I've been acquiring books for the Historical Society for the past 40 some years and a fan of Donnelly's for a lot longer than that. I think of Donnelly as the most interesting Minnesotan ever and if I could go back in time and talk to any Minnesotan, this is the guy that I would, uh, I would want to talk to. If you're the son of an Irish immigrant, I think you're well aware of oppression. And so I think the purpose of Ignatius going into politics was to improve other people's lives. He was as progressive as uh, Bernie Sanders, and of course, back to his Irishness, he was very uh, much a Joe Biden. By my count, he had run for office 17 times and lost nine of those times and withdrew a couple of times. He had these defeats that really took a lot out of him. It just killed him. After one important campaign that he lost, he wrote, All of my immense labor has been for nothing. Which finally brings us back here. I know kind of what happened and how Donnelly got named because the rail, when the railroad came through, they actually named it Douglas Station. And then Ignatius Donnelly came out here. Donnelly bought a bunch of land, a lot of land. These are the time of the Bonanza Farms. And on one level, Donnelly was an opportunist. So he bought that land as a speculative property when it was uh, cheap. And at the time, a lot of town names got changed and he just requested that this become Donnelly. And actually then they did name it after him. Maybe this was ego-driven, but he wanted to be remembered. He wanted to make his mark on society, and um, he did. 
Ignatius split his time between Nininger and Donnelly for several years, but farming is hard. Oh, I am much better fitted to write books than to run a farm of this size. Yeah, Atlantis was a bit of a publishing sensation. In his first major book, Donnelly claimed with great fanfare that the very fictional Atlantis was actually a very real place. The description of this island given by Plato is not fable, but veritable history. What he does is he goes out into the world and finds cultural artifacts that match up, you know, pottery in South America that matches pottery in Egypt. And this explains that there was this one culture that had sent ships out across the world and influenced uh, everybody. It, it sounds pretty kooky, especially to a 21st century audience. We don't really know deep down if he believed it or not. Uh, what we do know is that he, he believed it would sell books. Atlantis was a massive bestseller, and it gave Ignatius a much-needed win. My books have lifted me out of the dirty cesspool of politics. His follow-up wiped Atlantis off the face of the earth with a comet. There may be, even now, a comet coming with glowing countenance and horrid hair to overwhelm you and your possessions in one common ruin. You think the title of Ragnarok is badass. Have you seen the first edition of the book with the gold embossed comet? I mean, it's a beautiful book. Unfortunately, his next book was less well received. Definitely the most controversial was the great cryptogram. There is no doubt. Francis Bacon was the author of the so-called Shakespeare plays. And that's where he made his reputation as a, as a kook. If we commence to count from the end of scene two, column two, page 54, backward and up the first column of the same, the 477th word is the word son, and 477 is precisely nine times 53. And so I had Francis Bacon, Nicholas Bacon, son. Ignatius Donnelly was a bit of a hot mess. I have dipped into the nonfiction, but that doesn't interest me as, as much as his fiction, like Caesar's Column especially. I categorize it as a dystopian novel, uh, but it is science fiction too. It takes place in 1988. There are things like TV in it, and in the end, the heroine and the hero of the novel, you know, get on an airship and uh, go to Uganda and start a utopian community in Uganda. And Caesar's Column eventually sold almost a million copies. Donnelly's books were the blockbuster movies of his time. But to be so famous, and now 150 years later, to be so forgotten, it disturbs me a little bit. It doesn't give me much hope for the rest of us, no matter what we do. That's the fate of the world, isn't it? I'm thinking about that because I'm about to, uh, to retire. And here at the Historical Society, I've spent a lifetime trying to do something important and nobody will give a fig in five years. You do your best and you work your hardest and, and you try to make a, an impact. And then at some point in time, you have to give up the idea that, uh, that that's gonna be lasting because very little is. In the last 10 years of his life, Donnelly tried to build a third political party that better matched his progressive views. It didn't work. While I would like to be something greater than I am, it squeezes one's heart to see the years slip away. Ignatius Donnelly died on January 1st, 1901, the first day of a new century I think he would have enjoyed. <laughs>
Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage-funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram online at 967cram.com.